Hey everyone, Azure Yoshi here, and back again with another tutorial with RPG Maker. This time around, it's going to be setting up a D&D style attack. I'll just load up and just sort of show you what I've set up looks like. So again, if you go to special, I set up something called D&D attack. It's what it says on the tin. So what you do is you pick an enemy, you go for armor, you can go for pink. I have very creative naming skills, as you can tell. We'll go for pink here. You just sort of see, like, she rolled 11 to hit, the enemy's AC is 10, therefore you go get to do damage. And then, if we want to go for the other one, roll 13, but the AC is 15, and it misses. So, that's the main, that's the main thing we'll be sort of showing you how that works today. And So, first things first, is I'll, I want to show off some of the necessary plugins you'll need to get this to work. First one is you're going to need the Visual Stella Core Engine. You're going to need the Battle Core Engine because you're going to be dealing with action sequences. In this plugin, I've been using, or well, with this attack actually, I've been using the Visual Text wi Windows plugin from Visual Stella, but you don't have to. You can use just a regular text window, and it'll it'll just pop up over the screen. It won't automatically go away. That's the only downside. You'll have to have the the player will have to click the button to get rid of it. So it's a little, it's a, it'd be a little less elegant an option, but this one isn't necessary to get this to work. These two are. Also, I don't know how you would recreate this not using MZ, so you'd have to do something completely di different to get it to work in MV or VXAs compared to how I've set it up here because I'm doing this all through common events, basically. So you go into the database. There, I have two skills that I have set up to do this. So the first one is called D&D Attack. That's the one that you saw when you clicked. It said what it says on the tin. You know, so it doesn't do any damage. You can assign if obviously you can assign whatever cost you want to it. This is just normal roll to if you if you play D and D. This is like a you roll to hit. The, you're gonna roll to hit the enemy, and if you hit, you do damage. That's basically how this is set up. So it's just you're attacking one enemy. Very simple D and D style attack. We haven't gone into like saving throws or anything. So all this attack does, or the skill does, is it calls this common event D and D roll to hit. It doesn't do anything else. The other one you're going to need to set up is D&D damage. So I don't have any icon associated with this, no skill type, but this just will get called after you roll through the common event that's set up here. It's just a physical attack. It does HP damage. You'll see it's like math.randomint plus math.randomint plus two. So what this is equivalent to is all this is equivalent to rolling 2d6. You might be wondering, okay, why is there the plus two over here? Plus two is over here because JavaScript, this will roll a number between 0 and 5. I don't think your players will be happy if you just roll and do 0 damage. So this forces the floor basically to be from 1 to 6. Get it, obviously, because we're doing like D&D style rolls, no variance, and critical hits are determined based on your roll to hit rather than tied to how RPG Maker determines critical hits. So you just want to leave that off. And then it's going to call common event D&D action sequence. And for this, you'll want to put in the custom action sequence. See it? So like your player character will go up to the enemy and whack it. So you'll see I've called these different common events. This is going to be the tricky part. The structure of this is the fact the fact that I had to split these into two separate things means that this is going to be a little bit more complicated. I'm going to try and explain all the different reasons why I had to set it up like this to get it to effectively work. Okay, so I'm pretty sure this is the first one that ended up getting called, the D&D roll to hit. So for D&D roll to hit, you notice I have a few control variables that are up here. So the first one is most recent actor. So if we just click this, I see I've stored this in a variable. It's just who's the most recent actor to go. You just click to, you can go to click the game data down here last. You just find the last actor ID to act. And you just want to store that in a variable. And you want this to just sort of run immediately at the top of when this common event is called. The other thing you're going to want to have is most recent enemy ID. So you get that in a similar way. Just store it in a variable, set to the game data, last, target, and the index. And then another one is just, this is just simulating rolling a d20. So you have your roll to hit, you set it between 1 and 20. So if you roll to, so depending on if you want to allow like critical fumbles or critical hits with the system, I have it so it checks like, okay, if your roll to hit is 20, it's like, okay, here's your critical hit. What I have going on is, I have this control switch, is critical hit on. This is important to make sure that when it, you go, because this is eventually going to call another common event. 
for actor damage roll. If you want to make sure it is critical hit on to make sure it does double damage, basically. And then I have, like I said, I called the text window. So like if you're if the roll to hit was 20, it has a 5% chance to happen. It just says, okay, you got a critical hit. And so I just, that window just sort of stays. I put the weight so that hangs out for like three seconds. You can, you can make it however long you want, but. And then, so it'll run, after that, it'll run the common event for actor damage roll. I'll explain that one last, but I promise I'll get to it. And it jumps to label end. If you guys don't know what labels are, it makes it very easy to sort of jump around in your common events to get where you need to go in case a certain condition is hit. Because otherwise, if you just had roll to hit 20 here and you didn't have this jump to label end, which I have like here, it would still just go and reprocess all this stuff. And it'd still be like, oh, if you had a roll to hit 20, you're probably going to be over the enemy's AC. And it would just rerun everything again. So make sure you have a label to jump to the end of it if you have a critical hit. Because you don't really need to process the rest of this stuff if you just roll a natural 20. Similarly, if you want to set up, if you're like, oh, your roll to hit is a 1, the character can just fall flat on their face and have no chance of hitting or hurt themselves or however you want to punish your players in that regard I don't know how vicious you want to get anyway so the next thing is actor proficiency bonus so you'll see I've got a common event here we call this one so generally when you do D&D &D, you have like characters will have certain proficiencies with certain weapons or when they do certain types of attacks so if you want to customize that so it's not just like okay it's just gonna be a random 1 through 20 whether they hit or not but what if this character what if my most recent actor is 1 what if their what if their bonus or their modifier would be a plus three? Well, you just take control variable, roll the hit, because it's already been rolled. You just add three to it. Or like if certain characters get like larger or smaller, or even if you want to penalize it, you can make it minus. It doesn't just have to be a plus. And if you don't want a character to get any bonus at all, don't set up anything here. So after you check the actor proficiency bonus, you need to figure out what the enemy's AC is. So for here, control variables. You just want to create a variable called enemy AC. I've just set it so there's like a default AC because otherwise if you don't set it to anything, it's just going to be like, and you screw something up, it's just going to be zero. You don't technically need this step. You just, you, need, you do need the variable for enemy AC because you're going to need to call that later to make a comparison. And so this is just a bunch of conditional branches. So I've, if you look at my enemies tab, I've got, I've got two whole enemies, pink and armor. I know, very fancy, but this is just the enemy's ID. This is where you get the enemy, ID enemy IDs from. So you'll see here, she has her enemy ID of one. He has the enemy ID of two. So you go back to the common events. You'll see I check, okay, if the most recent enemy ID is one, you can set your enemy's AC just here rather than, because I guess you could try and force one of these parameters to fit AC, but I feel like AC is so different. It doesn't necessarily apply to any of this stuff. I've just decided to have a separate variable define enemy AC instead. I guess you can make it defense. Anyway, so it's like if the most recent enemy ID is 1, the enemy AC is going to be 10. And if the most recent enemy ID is 2, well, this character is going to have a higher AC, so they're going to be a lot harder to hit. So armor that stands for armor class in D&D. &D. I'm, I'm basically talking through this video assuming you know what Dungeons & Dragons style, like the attack system is like, mostly based on 5e. So... But if you're like, why do you call these as common events? Isn't there an easier way to do it than to do it this way? You, the, I found that you had to modularize this very specifically in order to get this to work. I was trying to call enemy IDs like in one shot alongside the damage roll, but it wouldn't always process properly. At least with how action sequences work in MZ. So that's the reason it's kind of broken out like this. It also makes it easy to just sort of go in and make quick edits like, okay, I want to add in a most recent actor equals three and their role to hit is blah. It's like, okay, I need to add in, I want to create a new enemy and I want to give them a different AC. You just go into this common event and do it. It's, it's helpful for just breaking it up. Anyway, next step of the code. This is, this is the fun D&D style part. If your enemy AC is higher than your role to hit, you'll see, okay, if the enemy AC is higher, it means your attack misses. And you're not going to be able to do any damage. You swing and you whiff. And you'll see I have like this text window here. So I'll, I'll show it off it. It has a few lines of code to it. but So first off it has like, you'll see forward slash n and forward slash v. These are, these are text codes. 
So this is basically calling the variable for the most recent actor that I defined above and putting the forward slash n surrounding all of this it just gives you the character's name. And then says roles of v24. So this just confirms like, okay, this was your role to hit after, and I say after modifiers because we've already modified that variable. The enemy ID is what? Is v21. So it's just checking your most recent enemy ID. I just mostly have this here as sort of a sanity check to make sure that like, okay, like the enemy ID is appropriate. You don't actually need this like once you have your system like like if you want to have it someone else playing it you don't need to reveal this information to them this is just more for debugging purposes and then your ac is and the ac is blah again this is just another sanity check to make sure okay the variable is what i said it would be good and then you can sort of validate that okay the logic is working okay if the ac is this the roll to hit after modifiers is this therefore it misses it's just another way for you to visually see that okay the code is working and then it says wait, and then it goes to actor damage roll. And then, okay, so the enemy AC isn't greater. So we're gonna say the attack hits and then you roll the damage. And for this window, it has the exact same logic to it. And it, I just say like, okay, instead of like that misses, that connects. And then again, it goes to actor damage roll. You'll see here, this is why the window removes right after the 180 frames because they'll just finish and immediately run this common event so that's partly why that's partly why I had to break it up into two separate things and everything go into the common event to go to actor damage roll and separate it out. But yeah, so all of these commands now go to actor damage roll. So I'll I'll just sort of go to this. So what this does is it again checks what your most recent actor is. So it's like okay, was it was it number one, number two, number five? And then it just sort of calls like, okay, if the most recent actor is one, we're gonna force an action with this character. It's gonna, it's he's gonna do the skill D and D damage. It's gonna be on the last target because that's sort of who you chose when you wanted to actually do the attack anyway. You could technically make these different, so like to differentiate like weapon types, because assuming like one of the characters is a priest, she's gonna be whacking things with a stick. That's probably gonna do less damage than whacking things with a sword or a spear or an axe. So you could technically make these different so that it's not all these characters rolling for 2d6. That's part of why I like the system. You get a little bit of flexibility, but for the sake of demonstration, I tried not to make this any more complicated than I had to. <laughs> okay, so everything goes to D&D &D damage. And if you remember, D&D &D damage was this thing over here, and it will call common event D&D &D action sequence, which is a custom action sequence. So this is the last one we have to show off. So I kind of like high level explained what action sequences were in the last, in like when I was doing the action command tutorial, but it's basically the same thing. So you want to be like, okay, this first one is AC set. So it sets to your action set. You need this before anything works. You want the character to go over to move to the target. If your critical hit is on, so that was a, that switch we set up before when we had the D&D &D roll to hit. It's so like, oh, if you rolled a natural 20, turn the switch on. This makes this can make your action sequence a bit different, like if you roll a crit. So you can, so for this one, I have it so it's set up so that the critical is 100 times higher. I know it's sort of a weird workaround, but it'll force it to be at least a critical hit if you, if you crank the raid up real high. I mean, your character has at least some chance to perform a critical hit. There is... It's not a perfect workaround, but it it tries. And if you and if you find that that doesn't work, you can just make the attack roll multiple times. But yeah, for a critical head, I have the character do something a bit flashier. The character jumps. They they sort of like jump. I think I have it so they like flip. They like they jump, they attack, and they f and they just sort of flip back, flip back around put in a weight just to make it look a little bit nicer. So this is just applying the action effect. So that's basically the rolling the 2d6 damage to do the attack animation. And then there's another like pop up that says, okay, you got a crit. Admittedly with how I've got it set up now, just for debugging purposes, it's set, it'll specify a critical hit twice, but it's not, it's good to have that satisfying pop up that says crit too. So. And I'll put it just a wait for 30 frames and then it jumps to the label 
end, which is way down here. It's confusing because you see the end here and then you see the label end, but it's the way RPG Maker does conditional statements. Okay, so if the situation is your enemy AC is greater than your roll to hit, what we'll say is like attack misses no damage. So they go, like your character goes up to the enemy, it swings and misses. And then waits 30 frames and then you're done. So that, that one's pretty easy to set up. You, you don't do anything super fancy for that one. Otherwise, you attack hits and your damage rolls. So for this one, I force the hit rate up. So it, because RPG Maker loves like compiling that type of stuff in the back end. You can set up the roll to hit like... It's like, oh yeah, that's nice. It gives you the logic for the D&D system, but you have to make RPG Maker's system like actually work that way. So you can just forcefully crank the hit rate up so that, yeah, you're, you're not going to miss. It's fine. I think I also did that for... Yeah, I made it a hundred times to make sure like the, the hit rate is actually like realistic. Or make sure you don't want to have a critical hit and have the character miss. You, you don't want RPG Maker's mechanics to like leak out. Yeah, so this one, you, uh, you go up to the enemy, pop up for hit happens, it applies the action effect, wait 30 frames, and then it's done. So at the end of this, I have the control switch, so it goes, is critical hit, turns that back off, so we, we don't want to accidentally leave that on, because otherwise if a character gets one critical hit, they're always going to critical hit, even if the roll isn't a 20. And then this is just your action sequence set, you finish off the actions, you reset everything. So yeah, that's basically how you do it. I know that's not exactly in a simple tutorial, but you can do you can do a roll to hit D&D style system in RPG Maker. You just need five common events, two skills, and a little bit of a creative thinking. Anyway, I hope this is useful for someone. I know I've seen like a few people wondering like can you do D&D style in RPG Maker? With action sequences you get a lot of flexibility. And it's not just like, oh, it makes your characters do walk up to the screen and do fancy things. Like, you can do interesting things mechanically with it, too. And I'm just hoping to show off some of that stuff for people so that it can be used to make other more awesome games in the future. Anyway, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoy this tutorial.